There is a common practice that's uh, very popular these days, and, and that is the idea that uh, one can construct uh, their own God, their own idea of their preferred idea of, of God. And you probably work around people who have their own idea of what God is like, and they have kind of put it all together, uh, bits and pieces of, of God. Hey, we could call it like build your own designer God. And designer gods start with your imagination. You, you construct it in your own mind, what you want your God to look like, what you prefer him to be like. And it's very common these days that people will have a hodgepodge of different ideas of, of what God is like because our our postmodern world in which we live maintains that truth is something that you decide for yourself. And so your, your neighbor's idea of God may be look, look different than the, the co-worker from uh, across the way. Y you build your own truth, you build your own God. I, I liken it to uh, Legos. Do you have in your home... Uh, like a collection of Legos, we do. After raising four children, and now with grandchildren, we have a tub of Legos that we have collected over the years. And uh, they love that, you know. They, they, they get out that tub, and then they spill it onto the floor, and they sit there in the middle of the floor, and they begin to work with their own imagination and begin to construct different things. And they come up with some amazing designs. Look, Grandpa, look what I made. Oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. What, you know, look what it can do. And say, yeah, that's a keeper. <laughs> and, and, and so we have these tubs of pieces and bits and all shapes and sizes. And in fact, the Lego company, if I understand it uh, correctly, uh, they will actually give prizes to people, like a $500 scholarship for those who, in their own creativity, come up with a new design and submit it to the company. Well, that's sort of like what happens when people construct their own, their own God. But there is no prize for those who design their own God. In fact, far from it, those who construct their own God are fools. And that's because what we may design and our concept of what God is like in our own minds is so far removed from who he really is. Isaiah 45 states, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God but me, a righteous God and Savior. There is no one except me. Do you do you listen to and do you believe in that God of Isaiah 45? Or have you constructed your own idea of your preferred God that you, you follow? I believe that the best place that we can discover the true and the living God is the Bible. And we look into its pages and we see there that God has revealed himself to us. Now, you got to understand that God was never under any obligation to reveal himself to any human being. He has chosen to do so, and what he has revealed to us is only what our puny minds can understand and what we can handle because he is so far greater than what we can even begin to think. Let me give you an example. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Samson's father before Samson was born, and the angel of the Lord announced to him that his barren wife would have a son, Manoah asked the Lord what his name was. In fact, he, he said, what is your name so that we may honor you when your words come true? What Manoah didn't realize is that he was talking to God himself. The angel of the Lord there was actually God. And the angel of the Lord answered Manoah when he said, what is your name with these words? Why do you ask my name since it is beyond understanding? 
Manoah's mind could not begin to comprehend the infinite, the true, and the living God. Because God's names reflect his essential character. I mean, who he is in his essence. And as he reveals himself to us in the pages of Scripture, there are many things about God. We just don't, even in the pages of Scripture, see, I don't understand that. And that is because God is infinite and we are incapable of human be as human beings of understanding him. He is incomprehensible in his essence. His glory, his splendor, his greatness is beyond what we have the capacity to understand. But what he does reveal to us in Scripture is marvelous. Now, what God has chosen to, to do is to, in the pages of Scripture, unfold who he is, beginning with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and everything we read beyond that is mind-blowing as we begin to understand who he is. Now, the clearest revelation of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 1, 2, and 3 states, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature. Now, I say all of that because we, what we looked at last week in the book of Romans showed us things about God that are hard to understand. And uh, we were faced with information about God that is beyond our grasp. Even the Apostle Paul states, as he kind of wraps up in Romans 11, how unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. Now, today we find ourselves in, he, in, in, uh, in Romans 11. And there is one verse that we must take time to study and to think upon because it tells us who God really is. Not the designer God that somebody comes up with in their imagination, but this is a God that reveals himself and this is who he truly is. It's Romans 11 verse 22. Therefore, consider God's kindness and severity. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness toward you, if you remain in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. Now, he says, consider, at least in this version. That, that is, take notice and think upon God's kindness and severity. Don't miss the and. Not just his kindness, because if you've got a designer God, one that you're creating in your imagination, I think you're going to be leaving out the severity part. You're going to keep that in the Legos and not use that for your own design. But we have to look at both his kindness and his severity. Now, let's do that today. Let's follow Paul's admonition here and to carefully consider God's kindness and his severity in order that we might be instructed and that we might apply it to our own lives. Now, the Bible is an account of God's kindness beginning all the way back in the book of Genesis. God shows his kindness to the human race in that the story of the human race did not end in Genesis 3, because it could have. As soon as Adam sinned, he could have swiftly and immediately died. And that would have been the end of the story. And in fact, he, it would have been just, and it would have been right for that to happen. But God, in his kindness, in Genesis 3.15, made a promise that he would unfold and, and begin to work out a plan that would reclaim and restore and remake what sin had corrupted and destroyed. And his promise was this, that from the woman, 
from Eve, there would be a descendant who would come and he would step on or he would crush the head of the destroyer who tempted Adam and Eve. And so the Bible records this wonderful, generous plan of God. And, he, and, they, and, it, and it, it shows it through the covenants that he made, beginning with the covenant that he made with Abraham. And then there was another, another covenant that happened at Mount Sinai. And, and another covenant that was made with, with King David. And these covenants begin to show us more and more and more of this amazing plan that God had in showing us his kindness, not in destroying us, but reclaiming and restoring and remaking what had been broken. In fact, he tells us that the Jewish people were the ones who were selected from all of the nations of the earth to showcase God's kindness. And some of those ways and those privileges that the Jewish people had is listed in Romans 9, 4. We looked at this last week. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. In other words, what Paul is saying here is my people, the Jewish people, have a special status separate from all of the nations of the earth beginning with the fact that they are adopted, meaning that God has brought them into his personal family, as it were, a relationship with them. This is language of intimacy and of, um, uh, of fellowship. He said, you're with me. You're in my family. But more than that, he showed the Jewish people how they could worship him. Unlike all the other nations who are bowing down to sticks and stones and, and idols made of, of metal, or, or maybe worshiping a mountain or worshiping the sun as the Egyptians were doing. And he said, I want to show you who I am. And they were privileged in that. In addition to that, they had the temple where God met with them. And where in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. And there, when the blood of an unblemished lamb was, was sprinkled, there their sins were atoned for, and they could have a right standing with God. The privileges that they enjoyed, showing the kindness of God, the, his generosity. And all of these symbols and these, these rites and rituals were pointing not to a system but to a person who was going to come. The fulfillment of all of this was the Messiah. And so we read about this Messiah as the Old Testament can, continues to unfold and we come to the book of Isaiah. And he tells us something about this Messiah. Again, more and more is being disclosed to us where he says his name is going to be Emmanuel, God with us. More than that, his name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and His dominion and rule over the earth will never end. Now, what I want you to see is the kindness of God, His generosity. And, and then what about our sin? What happens to that? Well, again, looking to this one who is to come, Isaiah 53 says, We all went astray like sheep. We all turn to our own way. The Lord has punished him, that is, the one to come, for the iniquity of us all. Now, you might think that the Jewish people, when, when Jesus uh, announced his ministry and was baptized, and you would have thought that they would have recognized him as their Messiah. I mean, he fit everything. Mo Moses talked about a prophet, the prophet who would come. Jesus was that prophet. And all of those prophecies that we see in Isaiah and Jeremiah about a new covenant, and all of these things, it began to unfold in, in Jesus' words, what he taught, and his works, 
which proved who he was. And it all lined up. Even when he went to the cross, it looked just like Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. You would have thought that they would have said, that's our Messiah. But they didn't. They didn't. Instead, Paul laments in chapter 9 of Romans as he says, this kindness of God which was intended to bring them to repentance has been snubbed. It has been rejected. Now, the question that Paul begins with in chapter 11 is this. In light of the rejection that the Jewish people have shown to the Messiah, does that mean that God has rejected them forever? And he says, no, that's not true. He says, I'm proof of that. Have not I become a follower of Christ? Have not I become a Christian? And, and is there not a remnant of Jews who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ and looking to him? He says, there's proof that we haven't been rejected and he likens it to Elijah when Elijah was, you know, had a pity party before God and said, I'm the only one left. And God said, no, you're not. There are 7,000 that you know nothing about that are my people. And Paul is saying, no, that's true. There is a remnant of Jews who are coming. But by and large, by and large, they have rejected their Messiah. And then Paul uh, follows it up in chapter 11 with another question in verse 11. Have they stumbled so as to fall? That is to say, have they sinned and have they fallen to the point where they are beyond recovery? And he says, no. No, God has a plan for the Jewish people. But he goes on to say... In his kindness, God is still wooing them back and bringing them back. And he's doing it in this way. And this is what applies to probably nearly everybody in this room. He says in verse 11, look, this is what God is doing. God is using Gentile Christians like me to stir up jealousy among Jews who would yearn to have what I have. And so he's using people just like us to, uh, to arouse envy within the Jews. It isn't unusual to hear in the testimony of a, of a Jew who has become a Christian that along the way they have become exposed to Gentile Christians and, and they will remark and say, you know, when I saw and heard them speak, um, something happened inside me. I'm thinking to myself, they're talking about my God, my God. And it's like they're on a first name basis. You know, and, and they begin to, to express their own jealousy, saying, I want or I wanted what that person, that Gentile, had. And, that, and Paul said, that's exactly what my ministry is all about. I'm ministering among you Gentiles in Rome and elsewhere. I'm ministering among you in order, in order that my people might become envious of what you have and turn in faith to Jesus Christ. So here again, there are two ways that God has shown his kindness. The first of these is Gentile believers. Gentile believers, like us, who were not adopted. We were not among the Jewish people where he said, you're in my family. We weren't. But we are now. And, and by and large, as I said, the, the, along as we look across the world, who is the majority who are coming to faith in Christ. And, and it's Jewish people. I mean, it's, it's Gentiles, not, not, not Jewish people. The gospel message, as Paul says, the, the Jewish 
people consider uh, it to be, they are, they are enemies of the gospel. And yet, look at how many. I mean, you look at the Bible colleges and the seminaries and the missionaries and going across in Asia, in North America, in, in the continents of Africa and Europe and, and Australia. And look at the number of Gentiles who are coming to faith. The, the kingdom of God is being flooded with Gentiles. The kindness of God to us, who were not adopted, but are now adopted into the family of God through Christ. But secondly, the kindness of God shown to the, to the Jewish people in making them thirsty to want what Gentiles have so that they might cry out to the Lord. You know, jealousy is a very powerful motivator when you're envious of what somebody else has, and you want it. And that's exactly what God is intending to take place. Now, what about the future? What is God's plan for the future with regard to the Jews? In Romans eleven twenty five, 25, look in your Bible. It says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you will not become or will not be conceited a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Again, the demonstration of the kindness of God as his plan for the future for the Jewish people. John Stott, in, in his remarks about this, likens it to like a boomerang. And he said uh, that God had blessed originally the Jewish people with um, the temple and with the scriptures and, 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 and a relationship with him. And yet they had rejected the gospel. They had rejected Christ, their Messiah. So it has turned to the Gentiles. But one day it's going to boomerang back to the Jewish people. And they will see for themselves that Jesus Christ is their Messiah and their Savior and their Lord. And then Paul goes on to say that when they come to faith in Christ, then it's going to kind of like bounce out to the rest of the world and the entire world is going to be blessed in ways they never imagined when that day comes. That's what he states in verse 12 of chapter 11. Now, if they, their transgression, that is, if the Jewish transgression brings riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fullness bring? This is his point, is that one day there will be a large majority of Jewish people who will turn in faith to Christ and the blessings of that day will spill over into the rest of the whole earth. And there will be wonderful things that will take place. There is coming a day when Jesus Christ returns and the Jews mourn as they see him, the one that they had nailed to the cross and recognize him as their Messiah. And they come to faith in, in, in a personal relationship with Jesus. In that day, there is going to be a bumper crop of blessings that will spill out and will be enjoyed by the whole earth. Now, this is, this is the generosity of God. Let me just summarize once again what we see here of the, of the, the kindness of the Lord. First of all, that God would not destroy Adam and Eve but instead provide a plan to reclaim and restore and remake what had been destroyed by sin is, his, is evidence of his kindness. And, and that God would choose Abraham to reveal himself and the Jewish people to be those who would, would demonstrate by their lives 
the, the character qualities and the wonder of God that he would do this, what had been hidden before, that he would do this and reveal himself is the kindness of God. That God would send Jesus Christ to be the sacrifice for our sins, for the remission of our sins, is the kindness of God. That God would invite the Gentiles, invite them to say, come in and share in this redemption that I'm offering, is the kindness of God. And that God would one day pour out a spirit of grace upon the Jews and then have that actually spill over and be enjoyed by the rest of the world is the kindness of God. So consider, Paul says, the kindness of the Lord. Now, how do we respond to this kind of abundant demonstration of generosity? How does it affect you? I mean, does it, does it move you at all? Or is this something sort of cerebral information in your mind? Well, actually, it ought to move us in, in three ways. First of all, we ought to be expressing gratitude to the Lord for his generosity to us, Gentiles. We're like that beggar beside the road, and Jesus comes to the beggar when the beggar is crying out, have mercy on me. And Jesus comes to the beggar and says, well, what do you want me to do for you? And what is our response? Our response is save me from my sin and remake me and, and, and give me what I don't have and what I don't deserve and what I can't earn. So we, we come with, with gratitude. But secondly, we ought to be filled with an expect, expectant hope of a new world to come. I mean, God is going to purge from this world all of the corruption by sin, and he's going to refashion this world back to its original, pristine, perfect world. And we will enjoy that with new bodies and, 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 and no more death and no more disease. It will be a wonderful, wonderful day, and God himself will dwell with us. And then the third, not only gratitude and hope for the future, but we ought to be filled with worship and wonder. I mean, look at Paul's words in verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I mean, you see how this is kind of like, you know, from chapter 1 to chapter 11, he's like a, 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 a bottle of soda pop where he just kind of shuck, you open the top and suddenly it just bursts out with this kind of praise because he can't keep it in as he considers God's great redemptive plan of mercy. Now, God's kindness is fantastic, but we need to turn the corner and we need to talk about something that's very sobering. And that is his severity. Paul's writing to, Jew, to Gentiles, predominantly in, in the Roman church. There were Jewish people there, but predominantly they were Gentiles. And he was saying, look, some of you are kind of smug, thinking that you're a little bit better than the Jews, because God has turned his attention to you. And you're acting a little bit presumptuous in, in your whole attitude. And you're tempted because of this to become lazy in your walk with Christ and to take your salvation for granted. And if you go there, you're going to be tempted 
to fall back into a, a life of sin and a pattern that is exceedingly dangerous and you're going to drift from the Lord. And some of you are going to say in that day, well, it's okay. It's okay because I'm saved. And, and it doesn't really matter because I'm a child of God and I'm saved. I'm one of the elect. I'm one of the chosen. And Paul's saying to those smug and complacent and lazy Christian, he says, hey, hold on there. Because consider the severity of the Lord. He has been very generous with you. He's been exceedingly kind. But if you spurn his kindness and you act presumptuous toward what he has done for you, he will cut you off. Now, you know, to be cut off from the Lord is a frightening thought. Now, I, I have to admit that this is one of those loose ends that I talked about last week that is hard for me to understand. And, um, and it's just all not, so, it's not all neatly packaged where I got them all tied up and saying, yeah, I got it all figured out. Because I don't have it all figured out. I don't think anybody does. And this is one of those that leaves me in a tension. I believe with all of my heart what I see in Romans 8, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I see there that to those who are savingly loved by the Lord, that there is no separation that that believer will experience from the love of God. But then I read these words, otherwise he will be cut off. And that bothers me. And I confess it, it's a frightening thought. So what do I do with this? Well, I'll tell you what I do with this. I treat this as a very serious warning. And we had best not treat with contempt. And better not squander the kindness that God has shown to us. And, and all of us, personally and corporately. Uh, here's my exhortation to every Christian here today. Never presume upon the Lord, but, but rather make yourself more determined than ever to run the race faithfully to the very end and to keep your eye on the champion of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, and put your face to the wind and endure through trials and through doubts and hardships, and vow to faithfully live for him. I mean, you already made a vow. You already acknowledged that you are trusted in Christ as your Savior. And when you were publicly baptized, that's a vow. You made a vow to God that you would follow him. And you would be faithful to him. God takes that very, very seriously. How dare we presume upon the Lord? Behold the severity of God. And think it through carefully. To become smug about God's kindness is to endanger ourselves because he may cut us off if we mistreat and we go back into a life pattern of disobedience. Romans 2.4 says, God's kindness, restraint, and patience is intended to lead you to repentance. How do we respond to this? We humble ourselves before God this week. We resist being proud and complacent, and, and, and smug. We mourn, and we repent. Behold the severity of the Lord. It's time for recommitment. There may be some within this room today 
where you have treated God's kindness to you with contempt by the way that you have been living and what you have been engaged in. And you have reasoned in your own mind, well, I'm a born-again Christian. Listen, be very careful. Oh, look what it says in verse 22. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. I mean, these are frightening words. I mean, if there is anything or anybody who is luring you away from a determined walk with the Lord, then cut that off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for us to take decisive action and, and, and to take those areas where we have been friendly with sin and to cut it off. Otherwise, God might cut us off. Now, this is a true glimpse of God. This is not a designer God. It says, well, I don't like that severity part. Well, you better, because that's who he is. Well, that's not my God. Well, then what God are you worshiping? Because he is that God. He's both kind, exceedingly kind, but he's also exceedingly severe. And, and he deeply loves us today. And hasn't he proven that? Hasn't he shown us kindness after kindness after kindness? Far be it from us to kick dirt upon that kindness and to treat it with contempt. And he said, otherwise, you will be cut off. Now today, I, I would call you to learn from this passage, not only to rejoice and to celebrate the kindness of the Lord in saving you and bringing you into the family of God and adopting you and say, praise God. But I also would recommend that you put up guardrails around your life so that you don't fear, veer off into some weeds somewhere and find yourself in a, in a very dangerous place. And so today, behold the kindness and the severity of the Lord. Let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we're th thankful today for how you have reclaimed us, undeserving sinners, and you have redeemed us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And as we have repented of our sin and we have looked to you, uh, you have generously and so kindly saved us. Now we pray that we would examine our own lives and not leave this place if we have been kicking dirt upon your kindness, that we would repent and turn back to a place of obedience. May we truly behold the kindness and severity of the Lord. Amen.